Hi everybody, welcome to the Sewing Basket, our window on the world of what's happening here at the Sewing Basket. Today we're doing our window shopping and our demos. We switched, we used to do just a sale and buy this and hold things up to you, all of that. So we decided last month that we were going to switch to more of a lecture demo and show you the products that we're using. Everything that you see me use today you can get on our website, sewingbasket.biz, go to the shopping page, and the very first category says Wise Guys Windows January 15th. So everything that we're showing you is there. We appreciate your support if there are some things that you need. Um, we hope you'll check out our website for that. But we're going to get going in just a second here, let everybody kind of hop on. If you don't mind, put in a little comment that says hi from wherever you're from. It's always interesting to see who's where and watching us. So what we're going to talk about today is quilt as you go. There are many, many different ways to do quilt as you go. This is one of them. This is quilt as you go construction, meaning that every seam that you do when you construct the runner becomes your quilting on the back. Now that I've told you that, we're not talking about this today. Cheryl already did a full video on this, Quilt As You Go Runner. It is on YouTube and it's also on our website, sewingbasket.biz, on the Daily Dose page. So there's a whole video on how to do Quilt As You Go as part of your construction. There is also a second video up there that is a create your own runner using Quilt As You Go methods. So those two things are already up there and available for you. Today what we're going to be talking about is quilt as you go using blocks or rectangles where the back of the quilt becomes the sashing. I'm going to show you point to just a couple samples here. We're going to talk about it, then we're going to go to the demo. We're actually going to make a little four patch project that shows you exactly what you're going to do. I'm going to be at the sewing machine. You can see exactly where I sew, just where I fold, how the whole process works. That demo won't take real long. I'm doing it on small seven inch blocks, so it'll be quick. We're going to, again, talk for a few minutes here, go do the demo, and then at the end, we're gonna do a trunk show. We're gonna talk about adding more creativity. When you think about how to do quilt as you go, people sometimes look at a project and say, oh, that's boring. I wanna do something else more fun. Well, the old adage, you have to crawl before you can walk. We're gonna teach you how to crawl first thing today, how to just make the blocks and put them together. Once you know that basic technique, you can do whatever you want. You can change the size, you can change what's in your blocks, and really have some fun. You can also, once you know the technique, look at patterns that were made as just a regular quilt pattern where you'd sew your top together and turn them into quilt as you go. So lots of things to learn today. We're going to talk for just a second about why quilt as you go. What does that mean? It means that I am actually doing the quilting right along the process as I'm making my quilt. Normally, you sew a quilt together, you piece your top, you have a big giant top, then you have a piece of batting and a backing that all have to be layered together. And then you have to base them somehow. Then you have to do the stitching, straight line, free motion. What are you going to do to quilt that? And then you have to bind it, all separate steps. When you do quilt as you go, it all becomes one process. So depending on the size of your squares, you can actually have some quilts where you don't even have to quilt. If your batting has a wide enough stitch distance, you can actually not quilt. The construction of the process will show, uh, keep the whole thing together. So you also don't have to bind. The edge of the backing comes outside the quilt and wraps around. Again, all of these things might sound a little confusing for a minute. All of these things we're gonna talk about and I'm actually physically going to show you how to do them. So don't get lost. And remember, we're on video. That means you can turn me off anytime you want to and turn me back on later when you want to. This live video, obviously you can't pause, but as you're watching this, don't try to get every detail. Just watch the overview while I'm showing you what to do. You can always go back later and rewind to watch the step-by-step -step 
uh, process in more detail. So just kind of enjoy the show, watch what we're doing. This will stay live, uh, we'll post to Facebook as a regular video once the live is over. It will also be on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash the sewing basket. And it'll also be on our website, again, sewingbasket.biz and uh, on our daily dose page. So let's get started. We're going to talk for just a second. This quilt over here is the one we're going to be dealing with today. We're going to make a small version of it, but this is just a simple block and sashings. This one is blocks with no sashing. We're going to talk about how to do that too. Surprise, they're on the back. We'll talk about that. This is a pattern called Garden Party. Beautiful design. It was made as a regular quilt top. When I made it, I love to do applique and I really like to use my decorative stitches. But if I make it in a regular format where I put the whole top together, I can't get in there to do decorative stitches. I can't turn the quilt to do decorative stitches around things. But if I do this one block at a time in a quilt as you go format, I can turn that block. I can use any of those fun decorative stitches that I want to. This one is done simply in rows, a different way to do it. You can do squares, rectangles, um, or full rows. Um, we just did a brand new pattern on that. That's on the website as well. This is one I did quite a while ago. Those of you who are regulars have seen this for a few years. This is all textured. These are cuddle fabrics and flannel and corduroy, um, but they're put together quilt as you go. And the last one over here, we'll talk about a little bit later, and uh, that'll be part of our end of the process. So I'm gonna walk over here and get started. If you have questions, go ahead and um, type them in, and remember to invite your friends in the future. So the way that I'm going to demo today is instead of standing back here behind the counter, and having you look at me, it's easier sometimes to cut and do things as though you're seeing through my eyes rather than in reverse. I remember years ago, I'm gonna show my age now, I took a jazzercise class with a friend and the teacher was always facing you and she'd be going one way and we're supposed to go the other way because it's a mirror image, I was always lost. So I like to be able to have you look at the blocks the same way I am. So what we're going to start with is the quilt behind me here on the back wall. That was 14 inch squares. We're actually going to make it in miniature. I'm going to use seven inch squares for the front and we're going to just talk about the process. In order to make that quilt, it's a nine patch. There are just nine squares. So I need nine of each piece. And by each piece, I mean I need nine pieces of backing fabric. I need nine pieces of my front fabric. And I need nine pieces of batting that are the same size as my front. So I can create something on my own just by having those three things. These two are the same size. The other one is two inches larger. So I've got a seven inch square and my back is a nine inch square. But I can have those be any size I want. Just remember, I need that inch all the way around, so a total difference of two inches. So right now we're gonna cut some of these. I'm going to show you some of the things that I do when I cut. This is just about a third of a yard of fabric. This is my backing, so I need to cut nine inch squares. I'm actually going to cut them all at one time. If you have not done multiple layers at a time, it really isn't hard if you have a new rotary blade, a good cutter, a good non-skid ruler. It is not real hard if you've got enough arm strength. So I'm going to just fold this in half and in half again. And I have four layers. On here, I don't have directional fabric, so I'm not worried about that. One thing I'm going to mention is if I was cutting bigger squares, the magic number is 14. 
My fabric is 42 wide, usable space. I can get three 14 inch blocks across if I cut it right, meaning the one on the fold I can't lose. So I cut a 14 inch block, I get two, and then I open up the one on the fold. If I accidentally cut this fold, I can't get my three 14 inch blocks. But today, right now, we're gonna deal with seven, excuse me, nine inch background squares. So I've got this folded. I have the salvages out so that they're not in my block. And I'm just gonna take my square up ruler. We do have a video out there on how to use a square up. When you're using one of these, your numbers run. You look at the corner, you find the one that has both number ones here if you're right-handed, if you're left-handed this way. But all I'm gonna do is put this down and I'm gonna clean my two sides first. I could have had a little smaller piece of fabric, but this way you can see what I'm up to. So I'm gonna grab my cutter and I'm cutting the top and the side. Handle it very delicately. You wanna move it as little as possible, which is why I did two sides at once. And I kinda of had it on an angle. If it had been straight to me, I'd try to cut this way and this way. It's a little harder on your wrist. If I do it on an angle, it's a little easier to cut both sides. So I cut those two sides, I spin all my layers around, and I take my ruler again, and I'm looking for my nine inch line, and my nine inch line, and I'm laying that down in this corner, along here and along here. So I'm looking that this is lined up nice and straight. My table's a little wobbly here. And I now have four background squares ready to go. That works great. The only thing you can't do in layers is if you have something directional or that you're wanting to fussy cut that it hits in a certain way, then you have to cut individual layers. But those are my back squares ready to go. The next thing that I'm going to do is cut my front squares. My front squares I cut the exact same way, just like I did, and I will end up with four of those at a time. My batting, this is a great place to use scrap batting. This is just some leftover pieces. I'm gonna cut seven inch batting squares. And again, I'm gonna use my square up ruler. And I'm gonna line up my seven inch line. And I'm leaving a little bit over seven inches here because I wanna clean up my edges really well. And when I mean that, when I say that, I mean make a fresh cut. So I'm going to cut these two sides. Spin this around again. These were my two clean edges. And I'm going to go back to lining up here. Line that up. And then I'm going to clean these two sides. And I'm going to cut as many of those batting squares as I need. When you're using scrap batting, you can use all different scrap. Just make sure that it's the same type of batting. You don't want to mix polyester and cotton or something that is bamboo with wool. So if you have batting scraps, mark them, just stick a little tag on them and write down what they are so that when you've got pieces like this, you can reuse all of these batting pieces again. So now I have a number of batting pieces and a number of fronts and backs. The next step is to fuse my batting onto my front square. And I can do that in a number of ways. I'm going to, this piece is actually fusible batting, one side fusible, I'll just slide my mat out of the way, and I'm gonna lay this right on top and get that nice and even. The fusible side of the batting is up, so the fusible is against the back of my block. And I'm gonna just take my little iron and I'm not sliding it to push the fabric. 
I'm just pressing it. And that is going to hold my batting to my front. Actually, to the back of my front, just to be confusing. So here's my front of my quilt, my batting, and then I have a background square that it's going to go on. Okay, a couple other options for um, attaching your batting to your block. Fusible batting, this was a single side fusible. We also carry a warm and natural double sided fusible. Um, it works well, it is poly. Um, it's what I used on the, the quilt that's in our background here, the 14 inch squares. Um, I really like it for wall hangings and table runners. It's a little bit stiffer than I like for a quilt. So I typically won't use a poly in a quilt, they just don't breathe quite as well. So I'm gonna take my next block here and fuse, or attach, I should say, this one in a different way. Here I'm going to use a product called Quilter's Free Fuse. This is a product by Alex Anderson. This is a shakeout product. It looks kind of, comes out kind of like a little salt shaker. And I just sprinkle that on. And those granules are the fusible. So I sprinkle that on. And again, I'm pressing, I'm not iron. If I iron, see how I get wrinkles and that just stretched it bigger than I want it to be. So I always want to press when I'm attaching things, not iron. Iron is you're sliding back and forth. Press is I'm picking up and I'm moving to a new spot. And this is bonding the fusible to my top. So there's another way. You can use um, a simple glue stick if you want to, just a few lines of glue stick and it'll stick just fine. Um, the other one that I like is 505 spray. Uh, the nice thing about the first two methods is there is no scent. 505 has a bit of a, an aroma to it. Um, you wanna be sure that you're working in a well-ventilated area. But when I use 505, I line my block up just the way I want it. I hold it in place and flip this back. Should have opened my can first. Hold that in place. And I'm just, just a tiny little spritz. I don't need a lot. Lay that back. And you just pat it into place. Again, don't brush it or things will slide. Just pat it into place. And this is the corner I was holding. I want to add just a little bit to that. And this does not have to be heated up. 505 is a wash away. So as soon as my quilt or project goes through the wash, that will all go away. But that is held in place here. A Little bit loose. I didn't spray real much there, but I really don't need to. So those are three different ways that you can um, fuse your batting square to your front. And now I'll show you the easy way that I like the best, now that you know different ways. If I have fusible batting, fusible batting has, which I have one of these ends I didn't attach. Fusible batting has a rough, bumpy side. That's the side with the fusible on it. The smooth side is not. What I did here is I took a piece of batting and my piece of fabric, and I attached the whole thing. I just I had already attached this. You can see it's stuck. The only part I hadn't attached yet is this end. And I'm going to do the exact same thing here. The advantage of doing it this way is you only have to cut once and your fabric and batting are held together. So if I'm going to cut this now, it's already fused together. Sorry about that. And I can just take my ruler and I cut my seven inch square and again I'm just cutting both sides and then spin it around and cut these two sides. Okay. Let's see, get that batting off of there. And so here, I only had to actually measure that seven inch square once. 
instead of having to cut my fabric and then cut my batting. So that saves me a step in the process if I do it that way. All right, that is how we cut our squares out. And the other thing I do want to mention, this is a quilter select ruler. Really nice, they have built-in non-skid on them. If you have rulers that don't have non-skid, there's a product called Grippy Spray. Grippy is, it's just an aerosol. You spray it on the back of your ruler. It'll make the ruler look a little bit cloudy, but it will turn the ruler to non-skid. It does wash off um, later if you want to, but it stays on for many, many uses. So it can make your old non-skid rulers, or your skidding rulers, non-skid. All right. So my next step, once I have my cutting done, and my cutting again is a background square, a front square with a batting square attached. I need one set of these for every block. So if I'm doing a nine patch, nine of these and nine of these. Once I have that ready to go, I now need to line them up. I like a ruler that's like two and a half, oops, two and a half or so wide to get a bigger line up or, or a smoother edge to line against. So I'm lining my one inch line up here. So there's one inch of batting under, backing under my ruler. And this is a little one inch ruler. So right here, I've got the corner. This side is one inch, this side is one inch. And I can pop that line up if I'm careful. I can just line that up, set it right in there. Just kind of pat it down. And then I can either take this ruler and double check or this is a ruler that I use a lot. This is the Nancy Zeman, the seams right. These are fun, we had these, uh, a plastic version of this years ago when I was in high school, many, many years ago. But there's all different measurements on here. This corner is all one inch. So I can just hold this. It's a real easy grab, um, really a handy little product. Again, those are on our website. So now that this block is set and ready to go, I have to fuse or attach this block to that. So again, I'm going to just flip this forward and I'm going to just use 505 for this. Pat, pat, flip it up, spritz, spritz. And again, I'm patting this down. I'm not brushing it and sliding it. So that one's ready to go. And again, that process is real simple. It's just background square. Line up your ruler at an inch, your other ruler at an inch, and put that right into the corner. And just double check that you're in good shape all the way around. Again, I could use a glue stick if I wanted to. A quick spritz of 505 is what I found to be the quickest. And because I'm just doing a little spritz, it doesn't get real stinky. So I've got two blocks ready to go. If I were doing a larger quilt, I'd prep all my blocks first. So we are going to talk for one more second on, I cut some other blocks that kind of coordinate, just looking at color. And I also, <clears throat> cut a block, decided I might want to add a border. A border is something that attaches just like any other block. I'm going to make my little square into a runner when I'm done. So I cut what's going to be a border piece. These two squares, my front squares were seven inches. This is 14 inches by seven inches. And so my back, again, you add two inches. This is 14 by seven. My back is 16 by nine. So I've always got one inch all the way around, and I'll show you how we attach these later. But right now, we're going to go to the sewing machine, and we're going to learn how to put them together. And Kathy's going to spin the camera around for me. And I'm going to grab my little iron here, and it'll take us just one second. 
to get over that way. And if anybody's got any questions, go ahead and type them in. And I'm going to take the camera here and put it in front of the sewing machine. It'll take me just a second here to line things up. And you're actually going to get a close-up view of what I'm working on here. So you can see my foot. What I have on is a walking foot. If you don't know what a walking foot is or aren't familiar, um, I just did Tuesday morning's video was using a walking foot. And it shows you the different ways to, different types of walking feet that are out there for you and how you connect them. That also is right on our YouTube page or our Daily Dose page. So my walking foot is on my machine and I now have two blocks back up just one second here. I have two blocks that are, you see my seam allowance here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take them and flip them over and I'm going to put them back to back. So they are lined up just like this. I've got one block, the other is back to back. I can feel on these corners where my batting is on the front and back. They should line up nicely there as well. Um, I'm going to talk about one of my favorite pins here for a minute. Quilter Select. This is a magnetic pin tin. These are really sharp and sturdy. They're really nice and strong. I like these a lot. And what I'm going to do on these, I can either, once you've done this a number of times, you can line it up by feel pretty well. But if you're new and you're nervous, you can take a pin and put it right in at the corner and be sure that it lines up with the corner on the back where that pin comes out. I'm not quite lined up there. So that is gonna line up. That's gonna tell me that my two squares are nice and straight. And I'm gonna do that on each end. And I'm going to be sewing along here. So I'm going to pin, and the way I pin, I'm gonna be sewing from this direction, going this way. I stick just a couple pins parallel to the edge that I'm gonna be sewing because I can pull them out as I go along. And I'm going to just stick those three pins in that way. So I've got pins across there. I'm going to be sewing this way. So now as I sew, I can pull the pins out as I go. And what I have here is my one inch seam allowance is going to come to the front because I have my two back pieces my backs are right sides together. And I'm gonna line up, I'm gonna sew from the edge here. I'm gonna come and I'm gonna sew right along the edge of the batting, right next to it. And I'm gonna stitch off this end. So this is why I did little blocks. So we can do this. I'm gonna just do a little lock stitch. And now I'm gonna sew across here. And I'm sewing, let me move a little closer here so you can see real well. I'm sewing right at the edge of this batting and as I go along now I'm going to pull out that pin and the pin heads are facing me so they slide out real easily. And I have that walking foot on so it's kind of eating up that pucker as I go along. It goes away and I'm stitching and I'm going to come right off the other end. When you do this for the first time and feel awkward, remember that Elaine said you're not doing it with a camera between you and the sewing machine. So give yourself a break. I'm going to cut that and I'm going to turn my camera over this way for just a second. And so what I have now is that's the seam I just sewed and I'm going to open this up and if I could get my fingers in there. So what I have now is a block, two blocks, with the seam allowance coming up to the front. Okay, so my two blocks are sewn together. And I'm going to go to my ironing pad. Two blocks here, I think you can see that okay. And I'm going to press this seam open. 
So I grab my little iron and I'm opening that seam completely. Okay. And now I need to roll this edge. I need to finish off this edge. So what I have here is two raw edges. And I'm going to take this and I'm going to roll it under this way. And then I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. This raw edge, hard to hold it and show you here, this raw edge is going to turn under that way. And I'm going to do that on the ironing board. I think you'll be able to see it okay as I go. So I'm going to take some best press and just give that a little spray. And I'm going to use my fingers and I'm going to just roll this edge underneath. So I'm taking this raw edge and I'm rolling it underneath till it hits this center seam. I hope that makes sense. So I'm going to just roll it underneath and I'm going to grab my little iron and I'm going to press it. Okay, and now I'm going to do that on the other side. Again, I'm just folding it in half till it hits that seam that I stitched and open it up. And again, press. Pressing is important. It keeps things from slipping. Okay. So now I have my block ready to stitch. Both of these raw edges are pressed under. And now I'm going to come and I'm going to edge stitch from the end all the way along this edge. So we're going to go back to the sewing machine here. And get on camera. And I'm going to just, and when I say edge stitch, I usually plant my, put my foot down, kind of line up where I want to be, put my needle down. I do a quick lock stitch. And now my needle is about not even an eighth of an inch. I'm really close to the edge, hence the name edge stitch. And I think you can see, I'm going to go down just a little bit more here. What I'm lining up is this edge of the fabric right here with that edge of the silver on my foot. I don't know if you can see it. I'm just use my scissors to point a minute. This edge of my foot right here is lined up with this. So my needle is actually just offset a little bit. So I'm going to stitch right across there. And if you're well pressed, it stitches really easily. You can sew pretty quickly. And not bobble and go off like I just did because I hit the camera with my hand. We'll pretend that was straight. Okay, and then I'm going to come back, flip it to the other side. And it should be, your stitching should be about this far apart. Right in here. Just a little bit over. And now I'm going to come back and do the other side. And again, I'm not real worried that I'm going real straight here because I don't want you guys to have to watch me worry about that. Okay? So that's what it's going to look like. Both pieces are sewn down. And now I'll show you the pretty one that I did later, or earlier, I should say. This is the same thing. This will show you kind of where that edge stitch should be. You should be able to see that pretty well. It's real close to the edge. If you're a little in, it's not a big deal. So what I have now is my two blocks are stitched together. And I've got that raw edge all the way around the outside. I have the one I just made. And I have the one that I made a little earlier. So where we go from here, if I were making uh, a quilt and I had, say, four squares across, I would keep sewing these pieces together. I'm trying to get a little further back here, sorry. I would keep sewing these pieces. I'd add another block, add another block, and I'd end up with my whole row of my quilt, okay? Right now, I'm only doing two patches. And once you have your rows done, you connect your rows. And the rows go together just like the blocks. So we're gonna pretend that my blocks have, or my rows have two blocks. 
So I've got this piece, and I'm going to back up just a little bit here so you can see that a little easier. Thank you. I, thank you, Kathy. I was trying to do that, and my fingers were dry, and it wasn't working. So here I am. I have my two blocks and my two blocks that are ready to go together. And they go together the same way. Back to back. I've got this one and this one. Okay, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to line up the center seam. I'm going to stick one pin in there, and again I'm pinning parallel to the edge, and I'm using my fingers to feel that batting underneath. And I'm going to stick another pin in there, and one more down here at the end. Okay. And so now I'm ready to go. I'm going to sew this edge from the edge all the way across, right across that seam. And that's going to connect my two rows. And again, I'm going to just do that real quickly here. And start all the way out at the end. A little lock stitch. And I'm going to stitch right along the edge of the batting and pull my pins as I go. Okay, And I'm not on the batting at all. It's um, This is still loose. I'm not sewing through that batting. If I sew through that batting, it makes um, the seam a little bit bulkier. So you want to try to sew right next to the batting and not through it. As you get to the joins, just keep sewing right across. And my end here, I didn't have a pin way at the end, so I just want to shift that over a little bit. And I'm ready to go. And I'm going to go right off the end. Okay. And now what I have is four pieces sewn together, here again, all four pieces sewn together. This is my first seam that I did. This is the seam that holds my row together. So I do the exact same thing. I press this open. Give it a little bit of Best press, press this open, and I would be doing this more carefully if I weren't on camera, but I want to get that seam pressed open all the way, and now I'm going to come back and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to roll this edge under, press it, all the way up along that length, okay? And I'm going to just repeat that whole process. So, and I'm not going to make you watch me on camera. So this is going to roll under. This one is going to roll under to the other side. So the rows go together exactly like the blocks. And then I'm going to edge stitch the whole length here. So my four blocks would be stitched together and completed. So that's all there is to assembling your whole quilt. You put your rows together by joining your center seams. Excuse me, you put your blocks together by joining your center seams. And once your rows are done, you put your two rows back to back, stitch along the edge, open it up, again, press and roll those edges under on both sides, and then top stitch. So that's all there is to it. The last piece that's left is the outer binding. This outer edge forms your binding. So this just rolls over, and again, a little best press, and I'm rolling that edge over, and I bet if I say, guess what you do next, you'll know. This is pressed, I turn this under, and actually, I'm going to actually sew this one so you can see the whole process. 
I'm going to turn that edge under like so. And keep that press. Do you think I need to sew the binding, Kathy? You think they'll want to see that? Maybe they'll tell me yes or no while I finish this press here. I know we've got that couple minute lag behind what we're doing. But so I've got this whole piece pressed and rolled over. So I'm going to go back to my machine. And now I'm just going to edge stitch along this edge. 50-50, all right, and then I'll go only halfway. How's that? Okay. And I'm going to just stop right there. So that is what my binding is going to look like. It just finishes off that edge. I do my top or side to side, and then I come back and do the top and bottom. Again, roll this, roll this under and stitch, and that's my binding completed on my quilt. So all in one step, I've got my backing, my binding, everything ready to go. That's the process of quilt as you go. The funny thing is, you didn't see me quilt anything. The reason that I didn't quilt is because the batting that I used, if you watch your batting package, it will tell you quilt up to so many inches apart. The batting that I used said I can quilt up to 10 inches apart, meaning I only need a row of stitching if I have a 10 inch space with no quilting in it. My blocks are only seven inches, so I actually do not have to put any quilting in here at all. I could if I wanted to, I could go around these flowers, I could do beautiful free motion quilting, I could use my embroidery machine and quilt in that space, but I don't have to unless I want to. So the quilting, remember, keep your bobbin thread matching your back and your top thread matching your front. And then you won't, if you want your quilting to show, you can, if I'm quilting in, I don't know, pink thread, and I want it to show on the back, I can do the bobbin and top the same for quilting. But this allows me to do a lot of different things with, having, with being able to do very little quilting, which in my book isn't a bad thing because I'm not the world's best free motion quilter. Question? A lot of, a lot of people want to know what you do with the corners, if there's anything special with the corner and you can show them that. Yep, there is absolutely nothing special with the corner, but I will show you. So this is... The piece that I already stitched, I remember I stopped part way here so it's not completely done. You'd stitch the whole length. And this edge is rolled over, okay? These would have been rolled over and finished as well on the sides. All of those seams would be done. So here's my corner. All that I'm going to do is, again, press it just like this. And then this is going to roll under. And I'm gonna just, see that. I'm going to just use my little iron here. I am going to press this edge just like we have right along. And now I'm going to take this edge and fold it under just like I had been. Okay. And I'm going to give it a spritz. It always holds better if you give it a spritz of best press. Love that stuff. Keeps everything sharp. So here is this corner was already stitched. This I fold like so, and then I fold it under. So this is just like any of your other edges. The raw edge folds under, and now I'm going to pretend I'm going to stitch. I'm going to pretend I'm stitching here. This side is already done. I'm going to come back to the sewing machine here. And if this were my binding, I would be stitching along here. I'm gonna just pop in at this point. And what I wanna do is wrap, get close here. So I'm coming along 
When I get to the corner, I've got some little fuzzes here I want to snip out of the way. And a lot of times I'll just use a pin. I actually, I really like the curved awl that we have, um, but I don't have one up here. I'm going to just hold this in place as I'm stitching. I'm edge stitching along. And what I want to do is not make sure that this is nice and smooth, that I've folded it so I don't have something that looks like that. It's sticking out. See that? It's hard to see. Um, but I want this to be nice and smooth. And I just stitch right off the very end. And I'll take it out in just a second. I get to the end and I'm just doing a lock stitch. And so your corners just overlap. Okay? So this was sewed down first, this was sewed down second. So I've got just a nice, the back is just a square. Snip my little threads off there. That's what the back looks like. And somebody's going to say, can you miter your corner? Yes, you can miter your corners, but that's, um, that's once you've learned how to walk. First you learn how to crawl, square corners. Square corners are crawling, learn that process first. To do a miter, you actually fold this under on a diagonal, and then you roll. But we're not really going to talk about that today. But if you really want to do it, that's the tip. You fold that corner down on a 45 degree angle, and then you, again, fold and fold. But today we're doing square corners, and they work just great, and they look just fine. If I were now wanting to add my border, I'm going to just go over to my side here for one moment. My square would be looking like this, but all my pieces would be done. And I would have a raw edge looking like this, ready to join my next row. This piece was the piece I cut for my border piece, one big piece goes together just like the rest of the process. One second here. I've got this piece face down, my border piece, so they're back to back, right sides together. I line those up nice and straight. I sew this edge and that seam allowance comes to the front so that I've got my blocks and then my border is attached with that seam allowance coming to the front where I'm going to roll it again. So a border goes on exactly like you're adding another row to your quilt. So it's really a simple process. It's a little bit putsy when you get started. The more you do it, the easier it becomes. It is a fun way to make a quilt without having to do a lot of quilting. I'm going to spin around and talk about some other samples here. So give me just a second. I'm going to keep talking while Kathy moves the camera for me. And um, a couple things I didn't mention. I do like um, to use these numbered pins. They have numbers right on the pins. They're really nice for keeping track of your blocks. If I'm doing a row, I stick pin number one in the first, number two in the second. So if I've got a nine patch, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And that way, if my blocks get mixed up, I always know where they go. I always pin in the top left corner, and then I always know also what direction my blocks go in. So that works great. Kathy, you okay with camera? You wanna? I'm gonna put the legs on. <laughs> we got just a second to get our legs out here so that we don't make you seasick. All right. And um, just thinking if there's anything I forgot about. Now that you know the process of how to just put squares together, this quilt was, <laughs> got your leg okay? <laughs> Moving in on you, you all right? This quilt is what we just did. Front squares, our back squares, are all one fabric, they roll to the front, our binding is all the same color. So this is 35 blocks, if I remember rightly. Um, 
went together very quickly. So I'm cutting 35 front squares. These were seven inches. 35 back squares were nine inches. And my batting again, same size as my front. Do all the squares just like we showed you. That's this quick little baby quilt. Again, you can make those squares any size that you want to. Also, these were all one fabric. We have the option of doing a lot of different fabrics and different fabrics on the back. This one that we just talked about, just a simple nine patch. This, my back is all different. I knew that was going to happen. All different colors. And my pin cushion is. I'm going to just take it down. It'll be just as easy this way. Can't you think? Okay. So this is the front of my quilt. This is the back of my quilt. So I have a different color backing on each piece. I call that a scrappy backing. It's all mixed up. What that gives me is on the front, my sashings are all two colors. Whatever color is on the back rolls to the front. So I've got two color sashings wherever that back rolls to the front. Hope that makes sense to everybody. So think about your back. Again, the blue one, all of the squares were turquoise. The back squares were turquoise. So my sashing is all turquoise. Time for a sales pitch. This is our new instruction sheet. The video that you're watching is free shows you everything you need to do, but a lot of people say, I still want a pattern. So we did do a pattern. This again is on sewingbasket.biz on our shopping page. It's called Quilt As You Go, Create a Quilt Tips. It gives you the cutting instructions for the quilt that I just held up, and it gives you tips and instructions on how to do different things as well. And we also did a pattern for this one, Quilting in Rows. That is a new pattern also with full instructions on how to make a row quilt, quilt as you go. I'll give you a tip. It's done the same way as a square. It's just a rectangle. Um, the other thing that we talk about um, in the pattern is if you have a, a quilt, what if I want a quilt, but I don't want any sashing on the front? Can you do that with this method? Yes, you can. That's what this is. Okay, no sashing. Guess where the sashing is? The sashing rolls to the back. So you have to think a little bit in reverse. Whatever, when we were talking previously, the smaller square was always the front. On this, the smaller square is the back. The small square still has the batting to it, but the piece that technically is my larger piece, the back, goes on this side. So you make it the exact same way, it's just that this side is now the front. Could you call this side the front? You sure could if you wanted to. I could embroider in there. It's kind of pretty this way, seeing the sashing. But if I am doing something where I don't want to see the sashing, I just do it in reverse. The larger square becomes my front, the smaller square becomes my back. This is actually our mix six table runner and placemat pattern, which looks like this. This was not designed quilt as you go. It is a regular pattern that says cut these squares three and a half by seven and a half. It tells you the size pieces that you're cutting. That's the size. Um, the lost the process of my thought there for a second. Um, in quilt as you go, there are no seam allowances. Because the pieces butt together, there are no seam allowances. So when you calculate what you're doing, when you're doing things quilt as you go, if these pieces were seven and a half by three and a half, the finish size is actually going to be seven by three. So that piece is going to be seven by three. If the piece you're working with is seven by three, the opposite piece has to be nine by five, always adding two inches, but you take out the seam allowance. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on that. It's a little bit confusing because you're all still crawling, okay? And also, 
there's no reason you can't just cut some squares the size that you like. That is perfectly fine. You can also use what I call leftovers. This is a block, and if we can walk over by this or spin over by this one, this one I didn't show you too much of right away. This was a quilt that was an applique quilt. These blocks, you made 12 applique blocks, and then it was pieced in between. I decided to do a quilt as you go, so I took my applique block, and then I added other pieces to it to create blocks this size. Each of these blocks fits into that quilt. This one, I set them, kind of offset them, so it didn't look just like three by four blocks. It looked a little bit more interesting. And in here, I used all the same backing, but it's multicolored. It's brown and black. So the back is the big paisley print. And that paisley is what's wrapping to the front. So it gives you a, a sashing that looks like you put in a paisley sashing. Again, it's the back wrapping to the front. And I picked that because I wanted the sashing to fade away. I didn't want a solid line separating all my blocks. So you kind of think about what your back is, remembering that's going to create your sashing. So you can make blocks on the little sample that we just did. Um, all my blocks were the same fabric. I can use different fabrics. I can use pieces that I have left over. I could put a quilt block here and add some more pieces. My front is the same side as my batting, and my back is an inch bigger all the way around. So that's the formula. It's easy to do. One thing that I'm going to mention is when I worked on Garden Party, I left my, I made my backings bigger. Sometimes if you're going to do a lot of quilting, you know how your quilt can shrink a little bit? I left my batting, excuse me, my backing big. I'll trim this down to an inch when I'm done. I'll do all my quilting, then I'll trim this off rather than doing the cut right at the beginning. It gives me a little more flexibility also, sometimes when I'm quilting around applique, I'm turning my block, things are moving. It might shift and get just the tiniest bit cockeyed while I'm stitching. If I leave myself that extra space, I can still get that one inch all the way around, even if things shift on me a little bit. And then let's get to playing with some fun stuff. Years ago, and before I talk about this, this panel is no longer available. We had ordered this panel, and when the rep came, they showed it to us on paper, and when the fabric came, it was a different color. We would not have ordered the Pepto-Bismol pink butterflies. So we had the panels here for a number of months, and none of you bought a single one. So it's like, what are we gonna do with that panel? So I thought, well, if I take this panel and I cut out the pink, the best that I can in any way that I can. Let's see what happened. So I made the back scrappy, which tells you what? Tells you that my sashing is going to be two color. And then I took my blocks. My butterflies were, I don't know, about a seven inch block. I decided I want them, wanted them bigger. So I made my blocks, I think those are 12 inch blocks. And this is what we did. And so where I had this butterfly, he had a pink background. I cut him out and I applicate him onto this. I also used my fabric to my advantage. This looks like I actually pieced these things in. It nicely had a blue border all the way around. And I had enough room that when I cut this out, I left myself a quarter inch of blue all the way around. And then I just applicate it on top of this green square. So each of these was just a little creation. Two fabrics, sewed them together, applicate this down. This one, again, two fabrics. So you can see how those blocks were made. 
And I'm going to just show you the back on this up close a little bit. You can see some of my quilting stitching on here. Does that look okay, Kathy? Can you mm -hmm. see that? Just some decorative stitches and some applique stitches. So this was created. It's just a simple nine patch, just like the quilt I showed you first. Nine pieces of fabric, make your back. Whatever size your back is, your front is two inches smaller. Okay? We do have a number of panels on the site yet, because everybody says, don't you have those butterflies? No, we don't have those butterflies anymore, because as soon as we made that, they, went, they sold. But this is another butterfly panel. Again, we have a panel category on the website. Lots of things that you can cut up and make interesting designs from. This one is a newer panel, all the birds. This would be really fun to put into a quilt as you go pattern. And then we're going to talk about just other projects for a minute or two. This one Cheryl did. Thought, hmm, wonder how small I can make this. The backing squares were five inches. The front were three inches. If this were a little bigger, it would be a great doll blanket. Again, the back is all one color. So the sashing is all one color. This one was again a panel we had a while ago. The back, all one fabric. So my sashing has my circles and my twists on it. And this is just a simple runner. This was a panel. What size did I cut the block? Exactly the size I needed for my panel. If I have a six inch panel, I can cut my blocks at six inches. A 10 inch panel, I can cut them at 10. Whatever size you want them to be. The one thing that you need to watch is remember that edge rolls onto the front of your block. So you're gonna lose about a half inch around the outside of your design. So if your panel has a design right up to the edge, maybe give yourself a little extra scrap when you cut that out so that that edge doesn't cover the um, absolute edge of the design that you want to see. This one was just four different blocks. The back of this one was pink. The back of this block was brown. The back of this block pink. Back of this block brown. So if you get two color sashing and it starts to form a design. So if this were, quilt were bigger and I did every other one, pink, brown, pink, brown, my squares would all be, um, have different sashing around them. If I put the pink squares on a diagonal, you would see pink sashing moving through the quilt on a diagonal. The pattern has a couple pictures showing different sashings as well. So that's just a simple little piece. And then once you've created blocks, you can do lots of things. This is just three blocks. It was three blocks in a row. I took the bottom block and flipped it up, and I took the top and flipped it down. I added little handles, and it becomes a purse. So if you think of those blocks as building blocks, there's just all kinds of fun stuff that you can do. Kathy, can you think of anything I forgot? No. If you would, we really appreciate it if you give us a thumbs up, make a positive comment, give us a heart or a like. We really appreciate that. And one last question for you. Do you have a favorite tip? What was your favorite thing about the video today that you learned? Please write a comment and give us your thoughts. We really appreciate the feedback and the input. It helps us prepare our next um, projects and demos. Again, we do Tuesday mornings at 9 is now our weekly Wise Guys. So we'll be back with you Tuesday morning. And third Friday now each month at 3 o'clock, we'll be doing our window shopping with the Wise Guys, um, which is an event like this evening, which is in the ballpark of about an hour. We appreciate your time and really look forward to seeing you again. This was our first time where we were working with the sewing machine and the camera. We'll work on getting that smoother every time we do. Um, but hopefully you were able to see everything up close and get a good feel for what we were making. Appreciate your time. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.